The Tolkien Road, Episode 105, The Lord of the Rings, The Window on the West, Part 1. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 4, Chapter 5, The Window on the West. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Or you can stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road, and you can find us on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. Episode 105, 105. Uh, book 4, chapter 5 of The Lord of the Rings, The Window on the West, and we're going to break this one into two parts, we decided. Partly, we decided that because uh, we are kind of, sort of, uh, at the beach at present, and Feeling so, lazy, let's just be honest. You know, like... We're on vacation. The... We're doing the bare we're, minimum. We're hearing the low, soothing, uh, I guess, blast of the horns of Olmo, you know? So, um, you know, we, uh, we we felt like we needed to slow it down a little bit, you know, take it a little yep. easier. We'd, we'd gotten a bit hasty there, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, change of scenery, change in uh, latitude, change in attitude. Mm-hmm. We're, uh, we're just going to take a chill. Thank you, Jimmy Buffet. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. All right. So I'm here all night. Uh, special thanks to our executive producer William Hutton. Yes, Dr. Hutton. Dr. Hutton, um, as well as our other generous patrons. If you'd like to contribute to the Tolkien Road, keeping us going, visit us on Patreon at TolkienRoad.com. Um, and we wanted to tell you about a very cool event that is coming up uh, very soon. Uh, in fact, it's coming up at the uh, the early part of June, June mm-hmm. 1st through 4th. It is Myth Moot. Four. That is Myth Mood IV. Myth, myth, myth Mood Four. A combination literary conference and fan convention sponsored by Signum University. This sounds like a very cool event. Very uh, cool. It, this year's Myth Mood, it's got the theme of invoking wonder. Mm-hmm. Invoking wonder, right? You know, things that are wonderful. Yeah. Right? Yeah, things that make you wonder. And it runs from June 1st to 4th at the beautiful National Conference Center in Leesburg, Virginia. Oh, it's so, such a beautiful part of the country. It is. It's an absolutely gorgeous part of the country. Very uh, very kind of Tolkienian mm. part of the country, I'd say. Yep, with the rolling hills and absolutely. the Mountains. Yeah. Absolutely. Special guests include Tolkien scholars Berlin Flieger and Michael Drought and famous Tolkien artist Ted Naismith. So, uh, Berlin Flieger, I've got like several of her books. You know, she's, she's one of the original Tolkien scholars. Right, you know, one of the people who was writing Tolkien scholarship before any of the cool kids were doing it. Right, awesome. so she's a—I mean, she's a trailblazer, right? Yeah, sounds um, like it. Michael Drought, I believe, and, and, and I didn't look this up, but I believe from past knowledge, he is—you uh, know—he's a—he's a pretty big name in Tolkien studies. Mm. Has been doing it also for a very long time. And there's a journal he publishes, and it, it, the name of it eludes me, but it's—it's it's one of the big ones, one of the big Tolkien. It might just be Tolkien studies, the journal he publishes, or is one of the editors for. So I think that I got that right. If not, I'll correct it next time. But anyway, I know he's a big deal. So you'll want to check that out, right? So go yeah. to, you can find out more about MythMoot 4 by visiting signumuniversity.org and clicking on the link for, Myth, for MythMoot or by going to mythguard.org and clicking on the link for MythMoot 4 under events. Uh, registration ends on May 7th, which is really soon. So, so don't delay. Get on over there and sign up for crying out loud. This is one area in which you should be hasty. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely be hasty to sign up for Myth Moot Four. Yeah, most definitely. Man, I really want to go. Yeah, maybe we'll go next year. Maybe, maybe. That would be super cool. Well, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe we'll go this year. I mean, I don't. I'm, I'm sort of getting convinced that maybe we should. Heck, maybe right? we should. You know? Yeah. That sounds pretty awesome. So, um. Go check it out, Myth Moot 4. Do it. If all else fails, if you don't remember anything I just said, just 
Google Myth Moot, and it'll come up. I guarantee you. M Y T H M O O T. Yeah. Myth Moot. I mean, every Tolkien fan should want to go to this. It just has an it's awesome like a Tolkien name fan's dream. too. I know it's like Comic Con, right? Yeah. But for Tolkien fans. Right, and other myth things. And I think other, there's myth other myth things involved in there, but I think the focus mm-hmm. is especially on Tolkienian right. type things, right? Right. So it's so. gonna be awesome. We don't wanna miss it. Amen. Preach a sister. Yeah, yeah. All right. So here we are. Um, so by the way, like we said, we're, this is gonna be kind of, sort of, an abbreviated episode this week because because we're on vacation. We're on we're on vacation. We're at the beach, and we're under explicit orders from Olmo to to take a chill pill. Yep. Right. Yep. And um, and you know you hear the you hear the soothing horns of Olmo, and it just like it just makes you want to relax a little. Relaxes more. your whole being. You know, mm-hmm. take it take it a little bit easier than you normally do. Take it right? easy. Keep it a little realer. Right. Take it easy. Mm-hmm. Don't let the sound of Olmo's horns drive you crazy. Okay, good. All right, I'm glad, go. glad you were able to do that for yeah. us. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Um, so <laughs> Again, I'm here all night. <laughs> all night? All, all right. Day. All day. All day. Well, no, probably not all day. I'm going to go out to the beach at some point. But anyway. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, you can probably hear the, you know, we, we've kind of kept the... It's a little. We were gonna record like out on the balcony, but it was a little too the the hor- the horns of Olmo were a little bit too yeah, loud out there. I think he's excited about our episode. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, so we decided to record inside, but we have the the door kind of cracked a little bit, so you can hopefully hear it in the background. A little bit, yeah. All right, so um, jumping in, we're gonna jump right in because we're gonna save our correspondence and haiku and secret words and all that jazz for this episode until. The second the final, part, yeah. the, second the second part, part of, of this chapter, of yeah. this chapter mm-hmm. right? Which will be the next episode. Yes. All right. And so a secret word we're gonna save. For yeah. The, so there's no secret word for this episode. No secret word, right? Yeah. You got it. Unless maybe we'll change our mind halfway through. But we probably won't. Boom. All right. Okay. Let's do this. All right. So, uh, starting things off, we uh, you know we left off last time and, um, the hobbits had just met Faramir and his. Uh, band of Gondorian warriors. Right. 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 And they they found themselves basically in the midst of a uh, uh, you know of a little battle there. Right. So yeah. Sam finally saw his elephants. Right. Yes. What do and you uh, and now um, they are they're they're post battle. Um, and Faramir shows back up. Yes. And so this chapter is really a lot of discussion dialogue if you will between Frodo and Faramir. Yes. And I love right? it. I love dialogue. Yeah. So, so I enjoyed this. Well, what what did you think overall about this chapter? You know, just before we dive uh, into the very well, specific Well, for the first part of it, I I really liked it. Yeah. I um like I said I like the dialogue. I really like um I think one of the things I like most about dialogue is I feel like you get some really um you get some pretty clear insights mm-hmm. into characters. Uh their personalities and motivations and you know their life force right if you will yeah so i i re- and you also you know there's some cool interactions in this chapter too i really like the interactions between you know most of the dialogue is between faramir and frodo right and um i thought it you know gives us some really good insight into faramir kind of where he's coming from mm-hmm. And it gives us some good insight into Frodo about how he's feeling about things this far. And even Sam jumps in at one point. Yeah. Um, to protect his master. So, um, I liked it. Yeah. I thought it was kind of a nice change of pace from yeah. all the action and well, well, stressful events. Faramir is, he's kind of, um, he's skeptical about Frodo's account of he himself, is, right? But They're, he's still very gracious and, right. um, you know, willing to hear him out. Sure, we definitely get a good we definitely get a good glam, good glimpse into Faramir's character mm-hmm. in this chapter. Uh, so, Faramir uh, early on in the chapter, Faramir says, "But it was at the coming of the halfling that Isildur's bane should waken, or so one must read the words." He insisted, "If then you are the halfling that was named, doubtless you brought this thing, whatever it may be, to the council of which you speak, and there Bar- Boromir saw it. Do you deny it?" And Frodo doesn't answer, yeah. right? So Faramir is wants to know what the deal is with Isildur's bane, right? Mm-hmm. He knows this thing by prophetic legend, but he doesn't know a whole lot more about it. Right. He's like right. trying to solve the riddle. Right. So um, 
Frodo, you know, Frodo is trying not to give away anything he doesn't absolutely have to give away, and especially when it comes to the ring, Frodo has just learned that he really can't trust anybody. Right. Yeah. You know, he's got to really hold his cards close to his chest. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, Frodo, um, Frodo, you know, says. Faramir asks him why he's trying to, you know, basically why he's trying to hide hide it. And Frodo says, um, not because I choose, it does not belong to me. It does not belong to any mortal, great or small. Though it, though, if any could claim it, it would be Aragorn, son of Arathorn, whom I named, the leader of our company from Moria to Raros. And so, by okay, wait, are you saying if anybody could claim the ring? ring? Yeah. Okay. Because it was Isildur's bane, right? And, right, and, and, and Aragorn's a direct descendant. It, it was, it, Isildur was the one who kept it for himself. And He's on that maybe off. even rightfully so kept it for himself, even though it wasn't wise to do, right? Right, because I mean he's the one that that got it. That, right, that, Lord, that right? slew Sauron, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, uh, if anybody has a rightful claim to it, it's Aragorn. But Aragorn chose wisely not to make his claim for it, right? right? <clears throat> yes. Not to put forward his claim for yes. it. Um. So. Uh, Frodo and Faramir go back go back and forth on this subject quite a bit. Um, at the name of Aragorn, you know, the tension always increases with um, when you're talking to the Gondorians, mm-hmm. the current Gondorians, mm-hmm. because you know, there's this sense in which they kind of are aware that this person might exist. Right. But time has it's been so long since anyone occupied the actual throne of Gondor that, you know, people are and this comes up later in the chapter. They're starting to wonder how long, how long does some, how long are we going to hold on to this promise of the return of the king, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but what Frodo doesn't know at this point is that Boromir is dead, right? He's not aware that oh, Boromir that's actually died. Right. That's right. Last he knew, last he knew was when they had that little encounter. Right. Right. When and, Boromir tried to take the ring from him. And unfortunately for Frodo, the last encounter he had with Boromir was. Um, I'm trying to remember, does he... Hopefully I'm not getting the movie and the book mixed up. But I don't think... Does Fro, does, does Boromir mm-hmm. at some point come to his senses with Frodo still around and willingly let him go? Or does Frodo escape and then Boromir comes to his senses? I think I think he comes to his senses after does... Frodo escapes. Right? Oh, oh yeah, because he puts the ring on, right? Frodo puts the ring on. Right. Comes invisible and escapes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. But I feel like in the movie, he comes to his senses before. I don't think I, he come, Boromir comes to his senses before he dies, but and he and he helps save the other. Right, but I think you're right. I don't think he. Um, I don't think he came to his senses before Frodo. Yeah, think, escaped. Think I think not, they left on kind of. Things not were not so good, good between terms. Frodo and Boromir right. when they left. Right. But and so Faramir says, "Then you agree to learn that Boromir is dead, uh, because Frodo was talking about what a valiant member of his of their company he was and." Right. Um, and Frodo, you know, Frodo considered even even after everything that went down, Frodo considered him a friend. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so Frodo says, "Yes, I would grieve indeed." Um, uh, then, catching the look in Faramir's eyes, he faltered. "Dead?" he said. "Do you mean that he is dead, and that you knew it? You have been trying to trap me in words, playing with me, or are you now trying to snare me with a falsehood?" Uh, and I love Faramir's line here. He says, "I would not snare even an orc with a falsehood." Right, mm-hmm. um, that's such he, a great line. Has, it is. He has. It's clear that he has a very high value of truth. Yes, he much, very much values truth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about like um, how you know, war. You know, like Faramir didn't have a problem with ambushing the Southrons, right? Which yeah. in, in itself is kind of a, a form of, you know, deception. deception yeah. Right. Yeah. But here he he, he, he says, cause. "I would not slay. I would not slay an orc." Or I would not uh, snare an orc, even even an orc with a falsehood, mm-hmm. right? Falsehood. So I'm just wondering about that, like you know, and I think that's I think that shows Faramir's nobility, but I'm wondering mm-hmm. is there any hypocrisy there? And I'm not I'm not trying to I don't think there is, and here's why. Um, you know, I think I think that there's room. I think there's a lot of latitude when it comes to words to not lie but not to reveal the whole truth for the sake of protecting your protecting oneself, right? Right. Well, it's the kind of a And to use words wisely in order to not commit an actual falsehood, but also not to 
Right. Well, that's where we you get give things, the whole truth away and be foolish. Like skirting the issue, right? Yeah. Or um, what they don't know can't hurt them. Mm-hmm. I mean, is it a lie if you withhold truth? I don't think so. It all depends on the circumstances, It depends right? on how you withhold it, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and whether, what, what right the person has to the truth. But mm-hmm. it's interesting, Faramir says, I would not even snare even an orc with a falsehood. So to tell an outright lie, right? Right. You know, um, Is an ambush not an outward lie, though? Well, I would say, I would say no, because, you're, because if the enemy knows you're there, it's wise they're tactic. going to kill you. That's right. right. Yeah. Now you're not strategy. you're not saying like, oh look, we're over here or something like that, mm-hmm. right? You know. Yeah. You're not saying meet us on the field of battle over here at this time, and then we'll have a fight, man, right. you know, man to man, and assuming good faith, that you know, on, not honor even between you know there there is such a thing as honor even between mortal enemies, right? True. Like where yeah. you know you have to take somebody at their word mm-hmm. for the sake of some, uh, you know, some greater some greater good further down the line, but. Yeah. Um, you know, there's never... It, so, would it be okay for Faramir and his men to be like, hey, Southrons, um, meet us on the field of battle right here, shake hands on it, we'll both meet there, and then we'll fight to the death, right? Mm. Okay, and then and then not be there, but be behind them after you just shook hands, and, right? Yeah. That would be, that would be, that would be a, a true evil to me, right? Right. Because... that's clearly breaking your word. Right. Yeah. That's a that's a clear breaking of the word, and mm-hmm. uh, um, and then but to withhold information or to conceal oneself in order to gain an advantage in that battle, you're not you're not doing anything that you're not revealing to them anything that they have a right to, right? Sure. They don't have a right to knowledge of where of where you are any more than mm-hmm. you have a right to knowledge of where they are, right? Yeah. True. Yes. So. Yes. Good call. Call. Anyway, it's interesting, these questions of, like, <laughs> truth and... Uh, you know, Faramir, he makes a very s- strong claim, right? I would not snare even an orc with a yeah, falsehood. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a very... That's a very unique moral perspective. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it is. Um, like... Especially that he uses the term orc, you know, which is like an embodiment of evil. Yeah. But he still has enough respect for truth to not use it against even an orc. Mm-hmm. Right? It's yeah. uh, it almost seems impractical, you know. Yeah, it almost like, seems you know, like completely impractical. Yeah. But then when you, I think when you weigh it against Faramir's actions as a warrior and knowing that you know it's not that doesn't mean that he just comes right out and says, "Hey guys, we're right here. We're about to ambush you. We're just letting you know so that there's not so it's fair and square." You know. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's. Uh, I don't think Faramir is like, he's not he's not a fool, but he is honorable. Right, and, and he believes, mm-hmm. and he believes in honor. Um, yes, it, you know. So anyway, it's. I don't know. It, it's a, it's an interesting question to me, and I'm, mm-hmm. I, and you know, if anybody else has any thoughts on that particular issue, I'd love to hear them. Um, yeah, I've heard a lot of you know different debate about the whole, you know, when is when is a lie truly a lie? You know, when when is a lie truly yeah. truly evil? And there's mm-hmm. lots of different schools of thought on that. There's some people that say like, um, you know, if somebody's truly your enemy then you know you have the right to do whatever you need to do in order to win against them yeah but i don't know it seems to me at some point you 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 start to become aligned more with evil and that's that's the whole that's one of the central points of this whole story right it's like taking grasping hold of you know the of using the evil object or the or doing the evil act in order for for some greater purpose in your mind Mm. Right? Is that when is that licit? Right? When is that when lawful? do the means just when do the when do the when does the end justify the means? Right. But yeah, that's the whole story. Point. That's 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 one of the whole points of the ring, right? Is that yeah. people want to grasp it in order to use it for great good, but mm-hmm. it'll ultimately turn itself back on you. So anyway. Right. Um so yeah, just one of those great lines. I would not snare even an orc with a falsehood. Yeah. Yeah. Um <clears throat> so um, so Bor- so Faramir shares with Frodo that Boromir is dead. Um, Frodo is not happy to know about this, but furthermore, Frodo is um, a little peeved at Faramir in thinking that Faramir has set him up. Right? Is trying. Yeah, is trying like to set him up. To trick him, or, right? Yeah. In order to say something to trap trap himself in mm-hmm. a you know in, into confessing something. Right. Right. Um, 
And um, as to the manner of his death, I'd hoped that his friend and companion would tell me how it was. Uh, and Frodo says, but he was alive and strong when we parted, and he lives still for all that I know, though surely there are many perils in the world. Uh, many indeed, said Faramir, and treachery not the least. So Sam, at this, gets a little upset at Faramir, mm-hmm. right? Sam's mm-hmm. starting to get, you know, a little bit like, what, what, what gives? Why are you getting all up in our face like right. this, right? Right, he's feeling the same way Frodo was, I think. Yeah. About it. Kind of like, dude, what's your beef? Like, yeah. Well, Sam, you know, Sam, when somebody starts getting on Mr. Frodo's case, uh-huh. yeah, that's when that's when the gloves come off for Sam. You know, he's ready. He's ready to fight. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Um, you know, you can you can you know you can make you know you can say something to Sam. You can get all, all up in his face. But when you start getting in Mr. Frodo's business, mm-hmm. when you start giving him the business, you better be ready. Yeah. You better, uh, you better glove up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't be giving Mr. Frodo the sauce, right? No. That's what it says there. Especially not the special sauce. That's right. Or, or the, the aw- secret sauce. Or the awesome sauce. Or the awesome sauce. You, you can probably give him the awesome sauce because it's awesome. But not the secret or the special. Right. <clears throat> or yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> but I love I love this part here where it says, "See, it's, Sam says, see here, Captain." He planted himself squarely in front of Faramir, his hands on his hips, and a look on his face as if he were addressing a young hobbit who had offered him what he called sauce when questioned about visits to the orchard. I love the fact that they have sauce in, scare, in, in the scare oh, quotes there. Oh, yes, yes. You know, something he called sauce, so that's where you know the whole don't get saucy with me kind of thing comes from, I guess. Gotcha, yes. Um, there was some murmuring, but also some grins on the faces of the men looking on. The sight of their captain sitting on the ground and eye to eye with a young hobbit, legs well apart, bristling with wrath, was one beyond their experience. See here, he said. What are you driving at? Let's come to the point where all the orcs of Mordor come down on us. If you think my master murmured this, murdered this Boromir and, they ran, and then ran away, you've got no sense. But say it and have done. And then let us know what you mean to do about it. But, that, but it's a pity that folk as talk about fighting the enemy can't let others do their bit in their own way without interfering. He'd be mighty pleased if he would if he could see you now. Think he'd got a new friend, he would. Oh, man. Yeah. He's not holding back. Right. So this is good. So Faramir, you know, says, Patience, uh, do not speak before your master, whose wit is greater than yours, and I do not need any to teach me of our peril. Even so, I spare a brief time in order to judge justly in a matter, in a hard matter. Were I as hasty as you, I might have slain you long ago. Don't be hasty. For I am commanded to slay slay. all whom I find in this land without the leave of the Lord of Gondor. But I do not slay man or beast needlessly, and not gladly even when it is needed. Neither do I talk in vain. So be comforted. Sit by your master and be silent. Um, So, you know, Faramir issues a gentle rebuke back to Sam, and, you know, that's good enough. You know, Sam basically says, look, according to the Lord of this land, I have the right I have the right to kill you. Right. right to kill you both. And I you haven't done that yet. You should be thankful that I haven't. Right. Yeah. But Faramir says it, he says it without anger. Right? He says right. patience. Right. 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 So Faramir just has about him like this, this like wisdom, you know? Mm-hmm. And I don't think he's that old, but he just has this sort of like um, wisdom and patience of not to get, uh, not to get too carried away in any business. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, just take your time, get to the bottom of it. Right. Um, everything, you know, like leave no stone unturned. Get, you know, basically get your bases covered. Get make sure you are asking all the right questions. You get all the gather. He's a very much information gatherer. He wants to make sure he's got all the facts mm-hmm. before he makes a decision. Exactly. And you gotta respect that. You do. He seems very noble. Mm-hmm. And I agree. I most definitely agree. Um, so, uh, this is where we find out that <clears throat> that uh, Boromir was Faramir's brother. Uh, he says to Frodo, mm-hmm. You asked how do I know that the son of Denethor is dead. Tidings of death have many wings. Night oft brings news to near kindred. Tis said, Boromir was my brother. And then he asks him, Do you... Do you remember aught of special mark that the Lord Boromir bore with him among his gear? And finally Frodo says, I remember that Boromir bore a horn. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, this is the mark, you know, of, this is a mark of authenticity for Faramir, right? Um, that they know that Boromir bore a horn. Um, so you mean, a mark of authenticity meaning that it's like a, 
it's proof that Frodo mm -hmm. is telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's evidence that he's telling the truth, right? Right. right. Um, and at this, Faramir starts into his story of discovering Boromir's, um, you know, Boromir's body. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he talks about how a few days back, uh, the boat he, he sees a boat on the uh, near the bank of the of the great river, mm -hmm. and it waited deep as it were heavily burdened, and it seemed to me as passed under my gaze that it was almost filled with clear water from which came the light, and lapped in the water a warrior lay asleep, a broken sword was on his knee. I saw many wounds on him. It was Boromir, my brother, dead. I knew his gear, his sword, his beloved face. One thing only I missed, his horn. One thing only I knew not, a fair belt, as it were, of linked golden leaves about his waist. Boromir, I cried, where is thy horn? Whither goest thou? O Boromir. But he was gone. The boat turned into the stream and passed glimmering on into the night. Dreamlike it was, and yet no dream, for there was no waking. And I do not doubt that he is dead and has passed down the river to the sea. So, um, Boromir, you know, so now Frodo knows that Boromir is dead. Mm -hmm. Boromir, um, it, you know, it's pretty impressive that this little boat was able to carry him that far down the river without sinking, right? Right, and also, I mean, weren't there, because doesn't Frodo kind of, Frodo kind of expresses his disbelief, right? He's mm -hmm. like, no, he must have been imagining this. There's no way right. that that boat, because weren't there, like, there was, like, falls, right, and some rough patches of, of river right. that he would have had to travel through. Right. And so Frodo is pretty much in disbelief. Like he, I think he thinks that Faramir kind of imagined all of this. Well, he says at one point, um, a vision it was that you saw, I think, and no more, some, e some shadow of evil fortune that has been or will be, unless indeed it is some lying trick of the enemy. I have seen the faces of fair warriors of old laid in sleep beneath the pools of the dead marshes, or seeming so by his foul arts. Uh, and Faramir's response, simple, you know, so, so Frodo says, look, I've seen plenty of examples of the Dark Lord mm -hmm. pulling tricks on people like mm -hmm. this, right? I saw, the, I saw the warriors in the dead marshes, right? right? Yep. And Faramir says, it, was not, it, was, it wasn't a trick of the Dark Lord, for his works filled the heart with loathing, but my heart was filled with grief and pity. Um, and, but, but Frodo still just can't understand this. Mm -hmm. How could such a thing have happened? For no boat could have been carried over the stony hills from Tol Brandir, and Boromir proposed to go home across the Entwash in the fields of Rohan. And yet how could any vessel ride the foam of the Great Falls and not founder in the boiling pools through, though laden with water? And that was what you were referring right, to. Right, um, It's a treacherous trip. Right. Um, so uh, Faramir, though, is not surprised because, he, because of learning that they had dealings with, um, with the Lady of Bluff Lorien, right, with the Lady of the Golden Wood. So he thinks the boat may be charmed or something? Like, is that what right. he's thinking? Um, exactly. So, um, you know, it's, it's, possible, um, it's possible that, you know, the, that a normal a, a boat made by mortal construction would not have survived such a thing. But with the elvish, you know, gift for constructing, mm -hmm. you know, sturdier things and things that last longer. You know, it's not surprising that this right. was a boat that was somehow charmed, able to make that journey without sinking. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, Faramir uh, cries out. He says, Boromir, oh Boromir, what did she say to you, the lady that dies not? What should she see? What woke in your heart then? Why went you ever to Laura Lynn Dorenin and came not by your own road upon the horses of Rohan riding home in the morning? Um, and, uh, and so, uh, the horn of, the horn of Boromir was not with them. The two parts that had been broken in half, right? And it would, right. and the two parts, um, had been found in different parts, you know, di di in different areas along the river by other Gondorians. Mm -hmm. And it says, and now the horn of the elder son lies in two pieces upon the lap of Denethor, sitting in his high chair, waiting for news. And you can tell me nothing of the cleaving of the horn. Uh, Frodo says, No, I did not know of it. But the day when you heard it blowing, if your reckoning is true, was the day when we parted, when I and my servant left the company. And now your tale fills me with dread. For if Boromir was then in peril and was slain, I must fear that all my companions perished too. And they were my kindred and my friends. But Faramir has reassuring words for Frodo. Yeah. 
He's definitely keeping a clear head about himself. Yeah. He's like, well, if they were all dead, then who put Boromir in the boat? Who, yeah. Who fitted him for a funeral? Yeah, certainly orcs wouldn't have put no, him in there. No, orcs would have done that you know, and laid him out. It, yeah. No. Put him in this nice boat. So that's really, I mean, that's, that's, that is very reassuring. And it's also mm-hmm. like, I bet Frodo kind of had a like, oh, well, yeah, duh. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, well, that makes sense. But you know how it is when you're under, oh, yeah, when you're when in a lot of peril. And yeah, and yeah, you're not thinking clearly, and you're scared. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a good thing that Barmir was there to reassure him in that sense. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. So, um, eventually, Frodo and Faramir go off to talk just the two of them, uh, because uh, Faramir, it turns out, has not been completely, completely forthright with everything that he knows. Because he doesn't, because Faramir understands the sensitivity of Frodo's situation and doesn't want anyone to be privy to the inf- to uh, everything that he knows, right? And to what he thinks Frodo has. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Faramir, when he when it's just him and Frodo, he says, "I broke off our speech together not only because time pat- pressed, as Master Samwise had reminded me, but also because we were drawing near to matters that were better not debated openly before many men." It was for that reason that I turned rather to the matter of my brother and let be Isildur's bane. You were not wholly frank with me, Frodo. Uh, and Frodo says again to the matter of truth, I told no lies, and of the truth all I could. Mm-hmm. Right? Which is a good, you know, so it's interesting, like, how this chapter really deals in that whole question of, like, truth-telling. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And when is, when is not telling the whole truth an evil act? You know, when is, when is withholding information... You know, a good thing, mm-hmm. right? You know that that's this. If there's if there's like a theme for the first part of this chapter, I think it has to do with that, right? Like telling the yeah. truth, telling the truth, right? Mm-hmm. And and falsehoods and lies and deceptions and all that sort of thing. Um, right. And when are they okay? And when are they not okay? Right. Yeah. Um, I think Frodo's definitely in the clear here. Yeah. Like he's he's being very wise. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. And I love the way he puts that, too. And of the truth, all I could. Right. So, he, you know, that's just a great way of saying, Let's, I've, everything I've told you is true, but there's clearly things I can't tell you. Right. And you just need to trust me that it's for your own good mm-hmm. and for the good of your people. So Faramir does some more conjecturing. He says, um, I, loved, I loved Boromir dearly and would gladly avenge his death, yet I knew him well. Isildur's bane. I would hazard that Isildur's bane lay between you and was a cause of contention in your company. Clearly, it is a mighty heirloom of some sort, and such things do not breed peace among confederates, not if aught may be learned from ancient tales. Do I not hit near the mark? Near, said Frodo, but not in the gold. There was no contention in our company, though there was doubt, doubt which way we should take from the Amon will. But be that as it may, ancient tales teach us also the peril of rash words concerning such things as heirlooms. Um, so, you know, Faramir is on the right track here. He realizes that this Isildur's bane may have been a problem, uh, you know, for for the company, right? That it wasn't mm-hmm. something that they were all just totally 100% united in. Although Frodo, I think, I think Frodo, like, considering how things left off with him and Boromir... Is being pretty darn gracious to Boromir here, you know? Yeah, no, I, mean, I would totally because he doesn't know that Boromir turned, you know, turned around, yeah. right? No, nope. um, he doesn't. He's only giving him the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. And I think I wonder how much of it too is just the respect that he is gaining for Faramir, mm-hmm. and now knowing that they are brothers, he realizes, all right, well, there has to be some of Faramir and Boromir, mm-hmm. right? So I think that may be kind of infiltrating his, his thought process at this point. Yeah. Just the family connection. Well, I think it also shows just how, you know, again, like Frodo, Frodo has just grown more capable of pity towards others, right? And mm-hmm. over time because of the burden of the, because of the burden of the ring. And, you know, I think even now he looks back on Boromir and understand like, and I think he fully understands why Boromir lost it like he did. You know, and it's hard for Frodo to look at him condemningly. You know, yeah, but because he realizes that 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 Boromir, in a sense, wasn't it wasn't the true Boromir, right? It was the effect the ring was having on him. 
Right, right. That there was this, yeah, the effect of the ring, you know, on, on somebody who, you know, Boromir, you know, again, was this warrior who was charged with protecting and gaining help for his homeland, right? right? right. The place that he loves, the place that he's been given a sacred honor to protect, mm -hmm. right? And here's mm -hmm. this weapon that he knows he could use for that very cause. And it felt to him, you know, and, and he's just increasingly tempted as they get closer and closer. And I think it's hard for Frodo not to be able to sympathize with that, even if the guy was about to kill him. Right. You know? Yeah. Because I, I think mean, deep down his intentions were good, right? Yeah. He wanted to use the ring, or so he thought, to defend his homeland, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there is nobility in that. Right. But do the means justify the end? Well, in this case, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, of course they don't justify the ends, but I'm... I'm more what I'm trying to highlight is like, you know, the way that going through temptation after temptation after temptation, like Frodo is. That Frodo's been going through, yeah. Like, the way in a, I think in a good person, mm -hmm. it can condition us, it can condition the good person to be more sympathetic towards others who might stumble, right? Yes, I would agree with that, absolutely. You know, who, who might yeah. give in to the temptation. Because mm -hmm. they know how hard it is to resist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Frodo hasn't fully given in to temptation, but he has given in to kind of a, a rash temptation mm -hmm. a couple of times to put the ring on. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, in, in very dire circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not the not in the same way with the, like the deliberate forethought of like I'm going to do this so that I can gain great power or something like that, but with like oh my gosh I'm going to get killed if I don't hide. You know. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, it's just it's beautiful to me how. This continues to highlight Frodo's deepening character and deepening, like, um, just ability to look on others who mm -hmm. are suffering temptation with pity. Yeah. I mean, we obviously, so far we've had Gollum, right, and Frodo's attitude towards Gollum, which Sam still just doesn't doesn't understand, right. you know? The pity and the, yeah. the kindness that Frodo's been showing Gollum. Speaking of Gollum, mm -hmm. he doesn't come up at all right. in this first part of the chapter. Right. Do we know where he is? Uh, is he hiding? He, he's hiding because he he's scared of the he's men. He's scared of fair men. Right. Yeah. yeah. He's off doing his own thing right okay. now. Um, so we get a little bit of history from Faramir on the stewards of Gondor. Um, and, you know, we learn that uh, they reckon back their line to Mardil, the good steward, who ruled in the king's stead when he went away to war. And that was King Iarnor, last of the line of Anarion, and childless, and he came never back. And the stewards have governed the city since that day, though it was many generations of men ago. So the steward of Gondor, you know, is basically like the vice president, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he's kind of the prime minister under the king, right? right? And it's his job and the job of his, of his uh, progeny to rule Gondor in place of the king until the king returns. But they apparently don't have the right to just step up and be like, okay, he's been gone long enough, I'm the king now. And, um, and Boromir, Boromir didn't, like that. didn't like this. Yeah. At all. How many hundreds of years need it be to make a steward a king if the king returns not? Few years, maybe, in other places of less royalty, my father answered. Denethor. Uh, Denethor didn't like it either. Right. And Gondor, 10,000 years would not suffice. Alas, poor Boromir, does that not tell you something of him? Uh, it does, said Frodo, yet always he treated Aragorn with honor. I doubt it not, said Faramir. If he were satisfied of Aragorn's claim, as you say, he would greatly reverence him. Mm -hmm. But the pinch had not yet come. They had not yet reached Minas Tirith or become rivals in her wars. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we get this sense of, you know, there's tension between the stewards of Gondor and the king, you know, the... the the idea that they can't be king, even right. though they're even though they've been ruling Gondor for centuries now, they can't actually become king. What do you think about that? Do you do you feel like Boromir does about it, or are you kind of like, eh, that's their way? Well, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think I think it's hard for us to grasp as like you know people of the twenty first century who you know, are used to yeah. more a very like democratic society yeah. where you get to choose your own leaders. Mm -hmm. Um I think I mean I think um I think even in ancient societies it was rare that you you know like in in societies where it was more just about having a ruler, yeah, eventually some like kind of a more of a despotic thing 
Mm-hmm. Eventually, yeah, some some if some new family can't produce, you know, the, if the royal family can't produce an heir, then some other member is going to have to step up, right? Yes, yeah. Some some other family is going to have to step up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but there's but there have been societies that view their their royal families almost as gods, right? As like members of a separate race, yes. yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah, sure. um, I think it's harder for those kind of societies to accept that. Now, with the case of, with this case, it's clear there was some kind of prophecy about a ret- about a return of the rightful king, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's why they're hold. I think that's why they were holding out, right? They've been holding out how many years now? Uh, I don't know the exact number. I didn't. Look, I don't. So have, been, it like hundreds, it's, thousands. Oh, it, it's been. It's been. A, well, it's been. I'd say it's been probably a couple of thousand, because they're at, you know they're they're towards. I mean, they're in the late three thousands of the third age, and. Isildur died in the early part of the Third Age, and you know, I, w- I don't think that the line of kings con- continued on long after Isildur, like you know, for a couple of cent, you know, a couple of millennia or mm-hmm. anything like that, right? Okay. I think it was like a couple of centuries, maybe. I see. Okay. And so I think it's been, it's been a, a long, long time, time, a long time, yeah. yeah. And um, but again, like it's not if there hadn't been this prop, you know, these prophecies that the king would return. You think they would have done something different? And, and also, like you got to remember, these were Numenorians, right? These weren't just men, right? These right. were men whose blood was mingled with the race of uh, the elves, right? Right. right. And uh, plus, Elendil and his sons had a special place in saving the Numenorians, the the remnant of the Numenorians from the fall of Numenor. Right. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And in doing, and it's Sildor was the one who slew Sauron, right? right. So, yeah. you know, you've got a pretty, as far as, like, kind of the the lore upon which, you know, a kingdom might kind of establish itself, the narrative upon which it might establish itself, mm-hmm. you're talking about some pretty astounding hurdles to jump, to overcome if you want to, if you want to be the upstart king <laughs> who's been the steward for a long time. If you want right? to be the guy that runs against the incumbent. right. Who's been the incumbent for the last thousand years? Right. <laughs> Good luck. You know. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know who who yeah. who wants who really wants to run for president against George Washington right. or against Abraham Lincoln? Right. You know, it's right. Like, you yeah. know the man the man of the man of legend, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. um, nobody wants to fill their shoes. Right. You know, it just doesn't. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna look awesome compared to them, mm-hmm. right? Nope. Um, uh, you know, when when you've got that kind of level of lore and myth and all that sort of thing behind right. you, right? Right, absolutely. Um, good question, though. I mean, what do you? I mean, yeah. What do you think, though? You asked the question of me, like. No, I agree with everything you said. I can see where just like it would be a huge, just it would take a huge change of mindset for all those people. And in a way, if they were to change to change things, it would be kind of. Uh, a step towards despair, mm-hmm. right? Because they're like, well, I guess the rightful king's never come of that, so we got to take matters into our own hands. I applaud them for having that faith, though. Yeah. But I can also identify with Boromir's frustration. Well, that's another, so that's another interesting thing, is when the stewards do step up, and they're like, the king's never coming back, so they, they crush the the lore and the great mm-hmm. narrative upon which yeah. the, the kingdom history, has been built, right? right? The history of their people. So they crush that, and what does that do? Yeah. Well, and they step up and be like, we should be it because we were the last ones appointed. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Now somebody else is going to come along from a different family and be like, we're great warriors, so we want to be it. And it's going to, what's going to turn into? Slippery slope. Civil war. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. It's going to tear the kingdom apart. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's another that's an, another huge factor. You're right. Absolutely right. Um, it's safer to stay with the status quo. Yeah, there's this, like, sacred, you know, you've got this sacred myth up there. Mm-hmm. And if you take that down, if you say it's not happening, everything that we're, everything that we've been holding out for is, is a lie. Yep. Then what do you have? It's it's inevitable. Fracture is inevitable. You're destroying the foundation on which your right. society has been built. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. That's yeah. a good question, Greta. Thanks, John. Give you a high five for that one. All right. Nice. Awesome Sweet. Thanks. Um. All right, and so they move on to discussing a little discussion about uh, the Gray Pilgrim, 
Uh, oh, yes. We've talked a little bit about on other episodes. We've talked about Mithrandia. some of Gandalf's other names. Mm-hmm. Uh, Faramir says, Mithrandir, we called him in elf fashion, said Faramir, and he was content. Many are my names in many countries, he said. Mithrandir among the elves, Tharkun to the dwarves, Oloran I was in my youth in the west that is forgotten, in the south in Kanus, in the north Gandalf, to the east I go not. So he's got more names than I think even, I didn't know about in, in Kanus before. Yeah, it didn't come up in our deep dive, did it? No. Um, so Frodo uh, has you know has bad news now to share with Faramir, and that's right. that um, Gandalf yeah, is gone. Yeah, demise, yes. Right. Mithrandir was lost, said Faramir. An evil fate seems to have pursued your fellowship. It is hard indeed to believe that one of so great wisdom and of power, for many wonderful things he did among us, could perish, and so much lore be taken from the world. Are you sure of this? And that he did not just leave you, leave you and depart where he would? Alas, yes, said Frodo. I saw him fall into the abyss. Um, so, uh, Faramir is, you know, just very upset to hear this. And, uh, you know, it's it's hard, I think, for, for them with news. Now, Frodo hearing of Boromir's death, Faramir hearing of Gandalf's death, not to think that, you know, they're really, their days are numbered. Uh, yeah. you know, they, they know they have, they must continue the fight. Um, the long defeat is right underway. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, they return again to discussion of Boromir and Isildur's vein mm-hmm. and Faramir laments. He says, alas, that ever Boromir went on the errand. I should have been chosen by my father and the elders, but he put himself forward as being the older and the hardier both true and he would not be stayed so Boromir was stubborn mm-hmm. Boromir was very stubborn um, and but what we learn about Faramir is that uh, is that he you know he avows I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway not where meanest tear hath falling in ruin and I alone could save her so using the weapon of the dark lord for her good and my glory no I do not wish for such triumphs Frodo son of Drogo so Faramir even though he doesn't know all the details about this thing, he's mm-hmm. uh, he, I think he's recognized that what a perilous thing it is. It is yes. And yeah. uh, and again, we hear kind of a a strong word from Faramir akin to what he said about you know he would he would he wouldn't deceive it. Right, an orc, an orc with a bullet. Right? Yes. Um, See, I don't care. So now he's he's talking. He doesn't know it's the ring. Right. But he's talking about whatever this instrument is. I want nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Basically, is what he's saying. Right. Yeah. Which again is a sign of I think real strength, right? Real moral Absolutely. moral strength. Yes. Um Faramir says, I would see the white tree and flower again in the courts of the kings, and the silver crown return and Minas Tirith in peace. Minas Anor again as of old, full of light, high and fair, beautiful as a queen among other queens, not a mistress of many slaves, nay, not even a kind mistress of willing slaves. War must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who do, who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend, the city of the men of Numenor, and I would have her loved for her memory, her ancientry, her beauty, and her present wisdom. Not feared, save as men may fear the dignity of a man, old and wise. So fear me not, I do not ask you to tell me more. I do not even ask you to tell me whether I now speak, speak nearer the mark. But if you will trust me, it may be that I can advise you on your present quest, whatever that be. Yes, and even aid you. Um, so, pretty, again, pretty astounding words you know, from Absolutely. Faramir there. Absolutely. I, I don't know how Frodo could deny him Yeah. his trust after that little speech. Right. You know, uh, and I do love, I love that Faramir, Boromir was more of a warrior. Faramir strikes me as, he's, he's, not, a, he's not a warrior at heart, Mm-mm. you know. He's more of a... Shepherd. Right. He, 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 he's more of a man of peace. You know, mm-hmm. he, he desires, he says, um, I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swift, swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only mm-hmm. that which they defend. Right? Yep. He loves the, he loves the great, he loves the great city and the men, mm-hmm. you know, the, the people that he serves. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, you know, so just, you know, a beautiful thought there and also a, a pe- another peek into... Faramir's character into mm-hmm. into who he truly is. Mm-hmm. So Frodo, Frodo here is you know really at a crossroads and he's got a big decision to make. It says his heart was heavy with fear and sorrow, 
If he and Sam were indeed, as seemed likely, all that was now left of the nine walkers, then he was in sole command of the secret of their errand. Better mistrust undeserved than rash words, and the memory of Boromir, of the dreadful change that the lure of the ring had worked in him, was very present to his mind, when he looked at Faramir and listened to his voice. Unlike they were, and yet also much akin. So with that, we leave on the, you know, on kind of a little mini cliffhanger of whether Frodo is going to ultimately trust. Right. Trust Faramir. Accept Faramir's offer of aid. And right. Yeah. So Frodo's got a big decision to make. Yes. Frodo has a big decision to make. Yep. All One right. of many thus far, huh? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, any more thoughts on uh, the first part of this chapter, Greta? No, I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Good job to you, too. All right. Well, um, wanted to uh, say thanks again to our patrons, patrons Y'all Rock, our executive yes. producer, Dr. William Hutton, Dr. as well as our other patrons, Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, James Applegate, Douglas Underhill, and Caitlin Fasista. And um, wanted to once again remind you, don't forget to go check out Myth Moot, right? Myth, Myth Moot 4. Um, Myth Moot 4, which is Invoking Wonder, right? Uh, don't forget to register. It sounds like it's going to be a blast for Tolkien fans, and you mm-hmm. owe it to yourself to go learn more by visiting signumuniversity.org and clicking on the link for Myth Moot. Or by going to MythGuard.org and clicking on the link for MythMoot 4 under events. Remember, registration ends May 7th, so don't delay. Be hasty. Be hasty. I don't care what I don't care what Treebeard may say, because this is MythMoot, not Entmoot. Right. Right. This is, uh, yes. Absolutely. And you know what else, John? Yes. I pity the fool. They don't register for MythMoot by May 7th. You know it. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, y'all. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks again to our patrons. Y'all are the best. And, uh, hey, you know, so we did do haiku for the first part of the chapter, so if you didn't get your haiku in yet for this chapter, you got until this coming Wednesday, which is the... 26th. Oh, you're so good with dates. I'm so good! All right, and, you know, hey, if you miss the 26th, you might still be able to get it in. So, you know, yeah. just send it along, and if send not... Send it whenever it's If ready. not, we'll send it over to our Twitter account, and we can post it over there. That's right. That's right. Which, speaking of which, go check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Tolkien Road, mm-hmm. and go check us out on Twitter at Tolkien Road. Yeah. All right. Please do. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Yes, and we thanks, will guys. Talk at you next time. Yes, we will. All right. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye, bye, everybody. Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with the second half of Book 4, Chapter 5, The Window on the West. Please send haiku or other correspondence to tolkienroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.